Finishing out today's fourth lecture in the Did God Really Say Conference is none other than Dr. Owen Strand. He hails from Grace Bible Theological Seminary in Conway, Arkansas. Greetings, everybody. My name is Owen Strand. Thank you so much for being a part of the Did God Really Say Conference. It's my joy to do this for no apologies and to work with Justin Peters and Phil Johnson, such, uh, such dear friends and, and godly men, and others, the Rosebro. Uh, men as well. So thank you all for being a part of this. It's a delight to come to you all the way from Conway, Arkansas. Uh, my first talk is on a Trojan force, why young evangelicals must not embrace leftist politics. As we begin, hear the words of Colossians 2.8 from the Apostle Paul. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Many of us have heard for years now that politics is basically nothing more than a jump ball. I'm coming, of course, from an American context, but I think that my reflections and the words that follow will relate to your situation wherever you are around the world. Because Christians inevitably disagree over political matters, it is said that we should simply say, well, we're going to disagree on matters that are political, and let's just opt out of that. The church isn't political anyway, and so we don't even really need to be in this conversation. We end up disagreeing with one another. We end up forfeiting unity anytime we try to get into politics at all. And so it's better to just opt out of this whole conversation and leave this to the left and the right, whatever that looks like in your country, to fight out. They're going to fight themselves to the death. They're basically the same anyway. And so we don't need to be either left or right. That is a very common way to think about politics, in particular among younger evangelicals today. If I can sharpen that phrase, it is frequently said of us that we should be neither left nor right. If I was going to sum up everything that I was just introducing and that I'll be critiquing in no uncertain terms in this talk, it would be that formulation. We should be neither left nor right. Right. Instead, the assumption, the working assumption, is that Christians are always, on every issue, basically, somewhere in this perfectly centered middle. You get out your calibration devices, you figure out the left, you figure out the right, you perfectly calibrate your position to be precisely in the center. I believe that this philosophy today masks a major problem. I believe it masks the advancement of leftism. I believe that leftism is a major, even massive threat to the health of Christ's church in 2021. I don't think that the truth is on the side, if I'm in America, for example, always on the right. I don't think that Republicans, for example, get every issue right. I don't think that every candidate for office who has the name Republican is necessarily to be aligned uh, in a perfect spiritual sense, with the kingdom of God. I don't think that at all. Nonetheless, I do believe, on balance, that these are not just political matters or party-driven matters. Actually, there are a number of issues over which the left and the right in my Native America, but also across the world, disagree. And my contention in this session is that you should care about these issues. You do not get a get-out-of-politics-free card. No such card exists for the Christian. Instead, you are supposed to be like John the Baptist in Matthew 14, 1 to 12. You are supposed to, in other words, tell the truth in the public square all the time. There's never an off-season for the truth. There's never a time to use Matthew 5, 13 to 14, where you switch off. It's right here on your neck. Did you know that? You switch off your being light or you somehow uh, brush off your hand and you stop smelling and tasting like salt. You're always supposed to be telling the truth. You're always supposed to be light. You're always supposed to be salt. Are there many different manifestations of being salt and light? Are there many different ways to emulate John the Baptist in a fallen context and tell the truth about a political ruler's sexual sin? Yes, there are. There's a lot to sort out and work out 
in terms of this broader conversation. This is a massive topic. It's really Christ and culture. It's really political theology. It's really how are Christians to be involved in the public square. Again, these are major topics before us. We can't answer every hard matter. What we can do, though, is this. We can identify that we are being tempted today to opt out of being salt and light, to recuse ourselves from the public square, and sometimes we do so under the banner of different theological systems, as if the example of John the Baptist in Matthew 14 and other biblical examples we could give is not in our copy of Scripture, but it is in our copy of Scripture. And you see, brothers and sisters, there are many, to go back to the text I read at the beginning, who would take us captive. Notice I didn't say there are many systems in an abstract sense that would try to take you and me captive. There are people who try to take us captive. What is it Colossians 2.8 says once more? See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. People are the ones who will come to you bearing philosophies, bearing worldly wisdom, and your commission, your charge handed down to you by the Apostle Paul just about 2,000 years ago is to deny them that opportunity. One philosophy or ideology that wants to take you captive is that of leftism. I'm going to explain what it is and what it believes and emphasizes in just a moment. But it's worth stating at the outset that you, every Christian, has the burden of not being taken captive. And I believe this philosophy and ideology is taking many captive. In fact, we've been considering and will consider over the course of this conference the subject of wokeness or social justice, critical race theory. In a lot of churches in which wokeness is advancing, that church has already prepped the way knowingly or unknowingly for its advance in too many cases by saying the neither left nor right philosophy. You, you get that connection. If you want your church to have an open door to wokeness, to social justice, to critical race theory, an excellent way to do that, to prop the door open with one of those door stoppers and have it flung open is to say, you know what, we're not really going to get into disagreements over public square issues or political issues. In many churches that have adopted that mentality in the last decade, wokeness is now to be found like weeds throughout the garden. Nobody really knows why those weeds are there. But as I have thought through these issues, I've written a book on this called Christianity and Wokeness that some of you may have seen. I believe that I have traced a real connection. I am no uh, I am no Sherlock Holmes or something like this of the theological world, let that be said, but I believe there is a connection between saying, we don't have a stake in these issues, opt out. And then ideologies like social justice and critical race theory showing up at the church by people, by people who peddle these ungodly ideologies. And guess what happens? When those people show up, when their teachings pop up, on a video screen, on YouTube, in a book, in the pages of a book. What have many Christians been trained to think, friends? They've been trained to think, oh, this is a public square issue. Oh, this, this impinges on politics. This relates to, to nasty left and right squabbles. I've been taught that I can opt out of those issues. So I have nothing to say here. In fact, you know what? Hard pass. I don't even want to engage this. I'm just going to go read a book about divine grace. You should read not one book about divine grace, as many as you possibly humanly can. Let that be said. But what divine grace, I believe, would have you see from the pages of Scripture is this. Many issues that have been classified as conscience issues are actually discipleship issues. Can I repeat that for you in order that you would make sure you get it? Many issues today that have been classified as conscience issues are not conscience issues, meaning there's not a clear biblical direction or trajectory to them. There's not a clear biblical stance on them. No, 
instead they're, they're a jump ball matter or there's something that we can all just disagree on and it doesn't really matter. In actuality, many issues that are political are discipleship issues. I'm going to be covering them in just a moment, just a few minutes. So that's the way I would try to help you understand a real distinction that we have to make in theology. Theology at base really is about making distinctions, making the right distinctions. There are conscience issues. If, for example, we are called to be pro-life, how are we supposed to be meaningfully pro-life? Well, that's a conscience issue. Some are going to say, if there is an abortion clinic, I should show up there every day in my city. Others are going to say, well, I, I'm pro-life ardently, but I don't know that that's my specific calling. Well, the Bible doesn't say whether you need to show up at an abortion clinic every day if you're going to be meaningfully pro-life. Uh, that's, a, that's a conscience issue for you to sort out how you apply that biblical principle. But a discipleship issue is a principle issue. It is not something that is a jump ball. It is not something that you have an option to believe or not believe. It is something that is commanded of you in Scripture, taught to you by Scripture, and therefore needful of obedience. That is a discipleship issue. There are conscience issues, many of them that we face, many gray areas and hard questions. And then there are discipleship issues, many of them, principles, truths, matters that call for obedience. I sense today that many of us have forgotten a key passage in Scripture, and this may surprise you that I now reference this. It's the Great Commission. It's Matthew 28, 18 to 20. If you're following along in your copy of Scripture or on your Bible app, uh, look with me at Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and said to them, to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. What an encouraging word that is, by the way, in the midst of our present madness. To the end of the age. The eternal son here in Matthew 28, given all authority by the eternal father. This is a gift. This is a, a calling, a charge from the father to the son and sending the son into our world. The eternal son issues a definitive mandate for his people. That's just another common word being used today. This is a legitimate mandate. This is a mandate of discipleship. The disciples of Jesus Christ, the true ones, are to go everywhere all over the earth and make disciples, make true followers of Jesus Christ. And they are to baptize spirit-born believers in the triune name. That is their charge and commissions. This is where many evangelical presentations of our time of the Great Commission stop. The whole Christian enterprise seems to be about missions and evangelism. Make no mistake, missions and evangelism must be central for us in any application of Matthew 28. It's absolutely essential that we do missions across the world and evangelize. But there is more in this passage than we often think. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Christ says, baptizing them, teaching them in the next clause to observe how much all that I have commanded you, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now that is the part of the Great Commission that is almost never expounded and unpacked, but it is right there from Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, the eternal Son, the one given authority by the Father. This son calls his church not simply to get someone to pray the prayer. This son calls his people to lead disciples into everything he has taught. Now, we would say, in reflecting on this with a completed canon, whole Bible canon and New Testament canon, that Jesus doesn't mean only obey the red letter passages, the words that he has said. He means the entire Bible, and he believes, he is teaching us that the New Covenant, the New Testament has binding authority on us as other passages make plain. And so the New Testament is the testament that his believers, his church, are called to follow. Everything that is taught in the New Testament is for our observance. Everything in the entire Scripture is God-breathed and is useful to us for discipleship. 
we are called to observe everything that Christ has commanded, and he is with us always. There is nothing that is too small that Christ and his apostles and the New Testament authors have taught for our obedience. Nothing is too small. Nothing is insignificant. Everything that Jesus has passed down to the first generation of disciples is to be passed down to the second and to the third and to the fourth and to the, what, what are we at, 596th generation or whatever it may be. We are called to observe all that Christ has command, commanded. Not some, not most, not a lot, not the parts we like, not the parts we're inclined to. We're called to observe it all. That is the commission. That's the Great Commission. That's not the Great Commission for Reformed theology geeks who like reading theology and listening to podcasts about doctrine. That is the Great Commission for everybody. There is no Christian who does not have the charge to obey this mandate. There is no church that has been given a leaner form, a reduced fat version of the Great Commission that this is not part of. All of us have been given this charge, which is a little bit terrifying when you think about it because not many churches have this mentality that we are going to lead people joyfully by the power of divine grace, the Holy Spirit working in us into a life of holistic obedience to everything Christ has commanded us, to everything the New Testament enjoins upon us. And yet, I repeat myself, this is Holy Scripture. This is the teaching of Christ. This is the only way to make true disciples. In fact, in many respects, this is the way to know whether a church is making true disciples. Does it merely get people to check off a box, or does it take people deep into the truth of God, the mandate of God, the imperatives of God, uh, all the sound doctrine of God? This then shapes discipleship. Discipleship is not a minimalist enterprise. Christian discipleship is a maximalist enterprise. Christ here claims all of life. Christ actively claims everything. Nothing is not Christ's with particular regard to the church, to his people. You see, Jesus has the rights over everything. Jesus has the title to the cosmos in his back pocket. Jesus owns it all, and Jesus has claimed it all in his substitutionary atoning death. And then his kingship over all the earth has been recognized, even vindicated, in his resurrection. So I repeat, there is nothing that is not Christ. Consequently, there is no part of the Christian life that is sealed off from Christ. We are not living our own self-directed, self-study Christian existence. We are living the life given us by God the Father for the glory of his Son in the power of the Spirit. All that we have, we have from God. All that we have, we have for God. We live life, therefore, quorum Deo, unto God. Every minute, every second of every day is quorum Deo, unto God. It may not feel that way. In fact, part of living in a fallen world and having to battle sin as we do, even as believers, is that our feelings don't match up with reality, do they? At least on a good number of days, a good number of occasions. You don't feel like life is quorum Deo. You feel like that guy's life is quorum Deo. You feel like that young woman's life is quorum Deo. They're really counting. Their life really matters. His ministry really counts. Wow, if I could only have that existence, if I could only have that family, if I could only have that Instagrammable uh, uh, setup, then my life would really count. But it's not true. It's gloriously true, to flip it, that every Christian's life matters and matters infinitely, and every part of every Christian's life matters. We work for God's glory, whether it's a ministry job or not. We raise children for God's glory, every minute for God's glory. We give to missions for God's glory. We engage in the public square for God's glory. We play baseball and eat a feast and listen to good music, and watch a beautiful film for God's glory. Do we do this perfectly and always consistently? No. 
But that is to be the heartbeat of our life. And there, we're, then we, when we fail, excuse me, then we repent and confess that to God, as we must do frequently as Christians. Nonetheless, everything is for God's glory. Our confession and repentance is for God's glory. It's all for God's glory, because all our life is quorum Deo. There is no opportunity to put your life into stealth mode like you do maybe sometimes on an iPhone or something like this on your web browser. There is no opportunity for the Christian to activate that system. You can't turn off part of your life and say, this part isn't God's. This part has no uh, enterprise, has no operation in part of the grand working of God. This part is sealed off. That's my life. The rest of my life, that's God's. When I go to church on Sunday, that's God's. He gets that. And he gets, yeah, he gets more of that. Uh, sure, he gets the parts when I listen to worship music in the car. Okay, I'll, I'll grant him that as well. I'm rocking out to whoever I like on my Spotify playlist. No, friends. There's no stealth mode in the Christian life. Every second is lived beneath God. Every second is seen by God. All your thoughts, intentions, attitudes, words, and actions are seen by God. That is a tremendously sobering reality for us, for all of us, and it should be. And if you're watching this video as it ping-pongs around the internet now and in days to come, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and you're recognizing that God has seen a whole lot of sin in you and your sin deserves an eternal death sentence in hell, eternal judgment that you will personally face, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to run to this all-consuming, all-claiming Christ. He offers you infinite mercy through his atoning death, and he gives you everlasting life through his resurrection. Today is the day of salvation. If you are a Christian, then to turn that around from the negative side that God sees everything, everything is an opportunity to glorify God, including the way you think about and engage in the public square. Let me then transition in this talk uh, to several numerous issues that we face in so-called politics. And what I want to do is extract those from a partisan conception and framework and reclaim them, whatever politics looks like in your context, as a matter of Christian discipleship. Now, the battles in your country may well be different than the ones in my country, and specifically in my state of Arkansas. There are differences here that I readily acknowledge, but whatever the specific contours of politics where you are, I want you to know that these issues matter. And they not only matter, they are actually outlined for us in the scripture. In Matthew twenty two twenty one, 21, Jesus says these monumental words, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. I want you to understand what this means firstly for religious liberty. Our first subject that is not a mere conscience issue, but a discipleship issue, religious liberty. This statement in Matthew twenty-two twenty-one 21 undergirds the essential nature of the church. The church is not ruled by Caesar. Caesar doesn't own the church. Caesar doesn't control the church. There are things that are owed to God because they are the things that are God's. These things are not Caesar's. And here Jesus is speaking of Christianity. He's speaking of worship of the living God in a holistic sense like we were just sketching out. Obedience through faith coming from God's grace. Christ's words here teach that Caesar must do everything Caesar can do not to encroach on the things that are God's. If I was going to use a word from the great theologian Abraham Kuyper, I would say Jesus here is teaching that there are different spheres. There is a sphere that Caesar runs. He's not the ultimate authority in that sphere. God still is. But there is a sphere in which there is a delegated earthly authority, and Caesar fills that role. 
And that's actually by God's common grace. And then there is a sphere of spiritual worship. And that sphere is explicitly here outlined as God's sphere. Or if you wanted to use a corollary concept and term, you could say jurisdiction. Caesar has jurisdiction from God to rule the state in certain forms, that is. But God has jurisdiction directly to rule the things that are his. And indeed, we will know from other texts that he sets up a, a system of governance in the church such that elders lead and shape and shepherd the flock. Caesar must, therefore, recognize Caesar's own limits. God has things that are his. There is so much to say about this text, but fundamentally, Caesar doesn't own the church or control the church. Caesar does not shape the worship of the church, not even a little bit. It is not Caesar's remit to do that. It is God's. We worship God according to God, and our worship is to be respected as from God itself by Caesar. What an important passage this is for teaching us about religious liberty. A ruler reading this text would naturally understand that they must not encroach on this area. A government then, therefore, by extension, must do everything it possibly can not to compromise the worship of God, not to try to dabble in and meddle in the things that are God's. This means then, by extension, that those who would follow God need to have the liberty to do so. That's what's implicit here. If there are things that are God's, then those who are following that God and partaking of those things must be free to do so. Religious liberty is of major importance for a society. In our time, though, it is imperiled in many different societies. Christians should support candidates and policies in their own context that back religious liberty and that protect related freedoms, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. These are not ultimate matters. In other words, if they take away your freedom of speech, you still follow God. That is not the paramount matter in your life, whether or not you have freedom of speech. But it is important. You see, friends, <laughs> there can be a middle category between that which is all-consumingly important, namely the worship of God, and that which has no import. There can be a middle category somewhere in here. And that middle category means important things, things that matter. It's not things that are of the most importance, but we don't have only a two-tiered framing of all of life in a fallen world. We don't only have that which is most important and then below that everything else that doesn't matter. That's a poor way to understand your world. There is that which is ultimately important, and then there are things that are of vastly less importance, and then there are things in that middle somewhere that matter actually a good deal. If you don't have freedom of speech in a given society, you should absolutely continue to follow Christ. But if you have freedom of speech, if you have religious liberty, you should fight to keep it as a Christian. You should be a meaningful presence in that society trying to preserve what you have, not fighting for it as an ultimate thing, but recognizing this is of value. This matters. For us to gather on a Sunday morning and worship God and not do so with the threat of state police about to jackboot the door open is a blessing. And if you're not in that context, that circumstance, don't try to be. Don't seek that. God may put you there, and if he does, then you live faithfully there. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of New Testament material that would help you work out how to handle that. And there are numerous Old Testament examples about how to handle that. But fundamentally, you and I should support religious liberty as much as we can and try to preserve it in our society. Religious liberty matters. Leftism would say to you today, it doesn't matter. You don't have to fight for it. It's of no value. It's of no importance. Christian leftism, so-called, would tell us all the same things. Neither left nor right. Jump ball. If, uh, if religious liberty falls, doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. 
Yes, it does matter. It's not ultimate, but it's important. Life, my second category, life. We're living in a culture that is in many ways pro-death. Death is all around us. In America, for example, millions of babies have been aborted. The opportunity to abort a child in a lady's womb, a woman's womb, is now considered a right. Good has been turned into bad, being pro-life. Bad has been turned into good, being pro-death, pro-abortion, pro-choice. In response, and in other ways this is true as well of a pro-death culture, we need to be clear. The Bible is ardently and unequivocally pro-life. The Bible is pro-life from start to close. It tells us that God created humans, mankind, in his own image, Genesis 1.27. And God knit us together in our mother's womb, Psalm 139.13-14. It gives us a powerful example of a wicked ruler who put children to death and did so in order to destroy Christ, to try to. The incarnate king in his infancy, evil Herod, thought that Christ was a threat to him, and so he put numerous, numerous children to the sword in Matthew 2, 16 to 18. You see, Christianity is not unclear in the least about protecting babies from the hideous evil of abortion. Every Christian should be meaningfully pro-life. That is not, first and foremost, a political issue. That is first and foremost a discipleship issue that is then applied, yes, in different forms to the public arena, to the public square, to politics in different forms. Just because something ends up being political does not mean that you, if you are not in politics, not inclined that way, don't like reading up on political news or whatever it may be, watching those shows, does not mean that you are exempt from it. Every Christian must be pro-life. The question is how? So every Christian should do all they can in the public square to support candidates and policies that are opposed to abortion. And to be pro-life does not mean 19 different issues. It is sometimes portrayed that way today. To be pro-life means that you are against abortion. There are numerous implications of that. You will want, for example, to see babies who could have been aborted but are rescued from abortion brought into the best family context we can try to help with, try to create. Absolutely. And a, a Christian who cares about life in the womb is going to have all sorts of other areas that, uh, that they care about as well. But when we talk about the pro-life issue, we're not talking about uh, welfare. We are talking about abortion, and we need to be ardently and unequivocally pro-life, and we need to be meaningfully pro-life. You do not have an opt-out button that you push, boop, there you go, boop, opt-out, because an issue gets political. This is a discipleship matter. It is not a jump ball. Third, limited government is my third issue, moving rapid-fire pace here. Limited government. We live in an age when government sees its role as massive in our lives. The state and its imperatives seem to keep expanding. The pandemic, as it is sometimes called, that has played out around our world, uh, has seen the grabbing of many rights across the world by the state, by different governments. And many younger Christians shrug their shoulders at this. Well, it doesn't really matter, again, political issue, jump ball, of no account, I have my quiet time, I do my stuff, I read my books on grace, I'm gospel-centered, and, uh, you know, it's fine. It's all going to get sorted out. Well, we worship a sovereign God, but it is not a good thing when a government, a Caesar, if you will, acts as if it is God. That is fundamentally wrong. That is against the teaching of Scripture. The growth of government, the size of government, the encroachment of the state is not a neutral issue. It is a moral issue. As we have already seen from Matthew 22, 21, Jesus was an advocate of appropriately bounded government. Think about that for a minute. The only perfect human in history backed limited government. Do you think the Caesars in the first century A.D., enjoyed hearing through the grapevine that Jesus had said that there are things that belong to Caesar and things that belong to God. Do you think they liked hearing that? Do you know something about many of the Roman emperors? 
Over time, there is a cult of emperor worship that develops in the Roman emperorship. And that means that the Caesars, at least some of them, did believe that they were God and did believe that they should be worshipped. And what Jesus was saying is absolutely throwing down against them, against that idea. He is throwing a tomahawk directly at the center of this idea. He is teaching that there are bounds to Caesar's power. Then and now, Caesar has sought to be as powerful as Caesar can be, and Christians are those who do not support an unlimited government. This is why, for example, in the American context, there is a system of checks and balances in government. This is why there is a constitution and a bill of rights. Are those documents ultimate? Are they on par with scripture? No, they are not. They should not be presented as such. Are they therefore of no importance? Remember our categories of ultimate importance and of no importance everything else? Is that true here? No, it's not true here. There is a constitution. There's a bill of rights. In your country, the documents may be different, but those documents matter. The government is held to that account in your context, and you as a Christian and we as the church should hold the government to that account. We shouldn't act as if there's no such thing, for example, if we're in America, as the Constitution. The Constitution is not ultimate, but neither is it unimportant. It matters. So all of this means that we as Christians recognize that there is a legitimacy of the state. We're not anarchists. We recognize that Caesar, to go back to Matthew 22, is constituted by God, if you bring in Romans 13, if you bring in 1 Peter 2, to bear the sword, to intimidate evildoers, to bring in appropriate taxes. And bringing in those appropriate taxes, we can ascertain, uh, means that there are going to be some public works that would be set up by the states, not just putting money in a pot somewhere. So there is a charge from God, from Almighty God to Caesar, in order to undertake a few select duties. We also recognize that Caesar regularly expands those duties. We know that Christians in different contexts will not have the opportunity really to speak against that. But if you do, if you do, as a Christian, you appropriately should do so. There are gray areas here as elsewhere, but Christians are those who support a limited government. We do so because of our doctrine of sin. We know that Caesar is not Christ, and we don't want Caesar to act as if he is. Next category, property rights. Property rights. Probably weren't expecting that. But hey, onward we continue, going boldly as such. In a context where Caesar expands, our property and our person itself, even our body, does this sound familiar? Becomes the providence of the state. The state, to speak more directly, seems to think it owns us. A state doesn't own us as Christians. We are slaves of Christ. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Our body is not the temple of Caesar. Caesar does not have rights over our body. Caesar does not own us. We should be a citizen under Caesar. We should submit to Caesar as much as we possibly can. Such submission is a meaningful part of Christian witness. And that matters for all sorts of elements of our life. But we are not submitting to Caesar as we are to God. You see, you cannot submit absolutely to Caesar. You can only submit absolutely to God, to Christ. All of this bears down on property rights in that some modern Christians seem to think today that they should just hand over all their liberties. If you want to use the disputed category of rights, all their rights. They seem to think they have no rights. They seem to think they have no liberties. Now, every Christian should be willing to lay their life down for the gospel, and every Christian should be ready to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. But you have to draw another distinction here. There is a difference between dying expressly for the name of Jesus Christ and living as a citizen in a place. You see, for example, in Luke's gospel, that the apostles carry two swords. There's a famous passage where they say to Jesus that they have two swords, and he says, it is enough. That passage is slightly enigmatic, but there is self-defense that is going on amongst the disciples, the ones who will die for the name of Jesus Christ. There's a broader conversation to have about when you lay your life down, 
And when you defend yourself, I can't get into all of that now. I can simply say there are appropriate forms of each. But it is true that God gives us our life. God is the one who has made our body. And as Christians, we have been reclaimed through the Spirit's agency as a temple, a center of worship of God. This means that we are God's. And this means, in extension, that it is right that you enjoy the gifts of God to you. Think about what the Bible says in the Eighth Commandment in the Old Testament. Exodus 20, 15. Thou shalt not steal. Now, the way we typically think about the Eighth Commandment is that, obviously, you shouldn't go up to somebody and take what is theirs, and you indeed should not. Nor should you in a deeper sense, unfolded in the New Testament, covet what they have. Of course, coveting is in the Old Testament as well. It's wrong there. But Jesus especially teaches us that he's not only saying the action is wrong, he's saying the heart intent is wrong. The desire to steal is wrong, just as the action is. But it is also true that there is something implicit here, that if you can't steal somebody else's stuff, there must be a proper sense of possession that God recognizes. In other words, what you have is yours. What your neighbor has is his. You may think you have a right to his property and possessions, but you don't. Well, what does this mean? <laughs> this means that you and I should recognize that we have property rights. We have possessions. We have bodies. And, and the state does not own those things. And we should oppose the encroachment of the state in these areas. Let's move on. A biblical sexual ethic is my next discipleship issue. Biblical sexual ethic. I don't need to convince you, I'm sure, that many societies today have moved away from traditional, let alone biblical, sexuality. Our theology and ethic is very different from a neo-pagan one. I've written a book called Reenchanting Humanity that attempts to make that distinction clear. We are not neo-pagans, even as we have had numerous Christians endorse or promote so-called gay Christianity or, relatedly, transgender Christianity. And the Bible supports no such thing. That is our evil talking if we embrace such things. The Bible, we remember, begins in social terms with a man-woman marriage, one man, one woman in a beautiful garden ceremony, the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2, 21 to 25. Out of the gate, Scripture signals that God exalts and loves lifelong covenantal union of one man and one woman. Scripture never wavers or shifts from the starting point. You see Jesus' words toward this effect in Matthew 19, 5 to 6. Nor does the Scripture shrink back from showing and declaring in no uncertain terms the wrongness of homosexual and extramarital sex, gender bending, and more broadly, forming one's identity according to one's unredeemed lusts and impulses. See Romans 1, 18 to 32. That was a mouthful of a sentence, but suffice it to say that the scripture is clear about the biblical sexual ethic, and Christians should be equally clear that we can only support that which honors God. And this means that in terms of candidates and policies, we do our, our best to support that which honors God. You don't have perfect choices here, friends. You don't in your context. I don't in my context. But as a Christian, as a salt and light Christian, as somebody who is trying to observe all that Christ has commanded you, you do the best you can to observe it yourself and then to try and help your society. Love your neighbor, Matthew 22, 34 to 39, by promoting an ethic that restrains sin and promotes God's design. Next area, true justice. True justice justice. Leftism promotes what is called social justice. Social justice is really about destroying creation order. It's about destroying the world that God has made. Social justice ends up opposing private enterprise, traditional society, the free market, and the biblical sexual ethic. Social justice is really about reversing 
the justice that God has set up in the world and the ethic and order that God has given us more broadly. Biblical justice is impartial, moral, retributive, and anchored in the character of God himself. Social justice, by contrast, is reparative. In other words, it doesn't try to hold people to account. It tries to heal. It tries to make the world a better place. Social justice, for example, is a judge sitting before an offender. That offender, let's say, has a troubled past. That offender has harmed people terribly. And the judge, instead of saying, here are the standards, you are held to them, and obviously hoping, as the judge does so, that that offender will experience the sting of uh, being held to account and turn back from that. No, a reparative sentencing says, ah, you've had a hard background, so I'm going to soften the sentence to make things more fair. That is what is called social justice. That is reparative justice. It is not retributive justice. It is a counterfeit that ends up promoting no justice at all. That is what a society driven by social justice ends up with. Christians should stand, we're almost done here, with candidates and behind policies that advance true biblical or impartial justice, not social justice. Leftism wants you to buy into a counterfeit understanding of justice that is no justice at all, that actually is the dread foe of true justice. We are never until Jesus returns, going to have perfect justice. Leftism is utopian. Do you know this? Please hear this from me if you've never heard it. It operates under the lie that if we will just follow it, if we will just buy into its policies, the world will be put back together and everything will be right. You understand at a heart level why people are drawn to this, but please hear me. Leftism lies. These things will not come to pass. In this life, only Jesus can put the world back together. Only he can make these things right. Can we work while there is day for justice now? Yes, we should, but we must not operate according to a counterfeit system of justice. We must not buy into the lie that if you have white skin, that you are a cultural oppressor. And if you're a person of color, that you are an oppressed person. That's a key part of social justice. And you must not buy into that. There is no biblical teaching along those lines. That is a lie that, again, actually robs people of justice and robs them of dignity more broadly. It condemns them in a new law, man's law, and leaves them really without hope. The free market, next and finally. The free market is everywhere attacked today. We are told that capitalism, that was Karl Marx's term, by the way, never use the term capitalism, except with an asterisk. Capitalism is evil. That's Marx's idea. Marx is the one who came up with the oppressor-oppressed dynamic. Marx is the one who wanted to set people at each other's throats, and he succeeded in doing so in one society after another. Marxism is history's most successful, murderous idea. The free market is an engine of liberty and human flourishing. It ain't perfect. And everybody who follows the free market is not going to end up in heaven, not even close. But the free market is a common grace gift of God to us. The free market is a mighty engine of good. And the Bible actually supports the free market. There are different manifestations it can take. But think about some different biblical teachings. The Bible emphasizes hard work, thrift, wise investment, multiplication of resources, and cheerful giving. See Proverbs 6, Proverbs 12, Proverbs 13. The Bible teaches us these values that are endemic to, part of a free market philosophy. Christ himself in Matthew 25, 14 to 30, taught what is called the parable of the talents. This is a spiritual lesson that depends upon the reality of exponential market growth. Christ commended investment. What he was ultimately commending was not a great retirement package. That's fine. He was, that's good. He was commending, though, spiritual investment. But he was using market investment as a positive reality, positive analogy. The Bible more broadly supports the payment of workers what they are due, 1 Timothy 5.18. All these principles are what we call free market 
principles. In sum, the free market is gloriously supported by the Word of God, which frames all economic activity in theocentric, God-centered, and ethical terms. This doesn't mean that the free market is perfect. It does mean that the free market historically, because it is biblical, has been a major helper to many. It has lifted whole countries out of poverty when embraced. Christians should not support the targeting and the downfall of the free market. Christians should line up behind candidates and policies that encourage the free market. Not because the free market can save your soul, it most certainly cannot, but because God has set up a world, thankfully, where your hard work at least often matters. Your thrift matters. Investment matters. These things are part of God's common grace to us. Leftism, though, would tell us capitalism is terrible, awful, has yielded nothing, and those who would tell us those kind of convictions are usually typing them on a fancy laptop, drinking gourmet coffee, eating a delicious scone, all furnished for them by different agents of the free market. Moment of silence for irony, ladies and gentlemen. All right, well, we need to conclude. Humor aside. The Lord, as I have said, does not expect you and me to find a perfect Christian political party, nor to find perfect political candidates. The Lord expects us to do the best we can with the hand we are dealt. But Christians should do two things. We should oppose evil to the full in public, and we should promote and stand for what is good. We should never do so as if those causes are ultimate. The cause of the gospel, the advancement of the message of salvation in Christ is ultimate. That is our ultimate calling, but we are teach them to observe all I have commanded you, Christians. We are great commission churches. We need to be those kind of believers. And so, friends, my prayer is that you, if you are a young evangelical in particular, but forget what age you are, you would not be drawn off by the false gospel of leftism. This does not mean that the right is perfect. It does not mean that the conservative tradition is Christian, necessarily. That is not the conclusion I would urge upon you. But it does mean that there is an ideology that is eating away our society, our world, and it is leftism. And furthermore, in that soil, scorched by leftism, the weeds of social justice, critical race theory, and wokeness grow nicely. And we need to be those who would oppose all such evil growth. There's a Trojan force let loose in the church. Don't join its ranks. Instead, follow the Word of God, the teachings of the Word of God, the principles of the Word of God. Form a biblical worldview. Stand for that biblical worldview. Pray to God. Share the gospel. Be a force of salt and light. And let's see what God does until his son comes back. God bless you.